This is a production of Cornell University. Um, today we'll be talking about hands-on learning in horticulture. Um, but first, and, and Steve did point this out. There we go. Um, we are in, Pen even though our name is Delaware Valley, we are in Pennsylvania. Um, I, I put a big star up here for, of course, this is Cornell. Um, we are down here in Doylestown. This is Bucks County, Pennsylvania. This is Philadelphia. And interestingly enough, we are just about as far from Cornell as we are from Penn State. So it, I'm going to be coming north rather than west from now on. Um, so I can't talk about hands-on learning and, and teaching in horticulture without um, discussing um, some of the work from Liberty Hyde Bailey. Of course, since I've been here, um, I've spent a lot of time uh, reading about Liberty Hyde Bailey, looking at all his portraits. Um, and I thought this was particularly interesting. He wrote a book back um, in 1910 taught, called The Training of Farmers. And he said, I regard certain kinds of demonstration work on farms as of the greatest teaching value if it is conducted by a good teacher. And this quote really struck home with me because we, um, we definitely use um, our teaching farms at Del Vale. We use the farms in the region. Um, and it's really important to the faculty at Del Vale to be good teachers. Um, we, for the most part, do very little research. We um, are not, we don't have to publish papers. Most of us do not have big research programs. Um, we don't have to, unless we want to apply for grants. What we do is teach. Um, and so, and I'll, I'll talk about that um, through the, the seminar. Um, so it's really important also to know a little bit of, uh, about the history of Del Vale. It was actually founded um, in 1896 as the National Farm School. Um, and so this is, this is Rabbi Joseph Krauskopf, and this is actually on one of the original buildings that is um, now still on our, our campus. Uh, but what's really interesting is how this all came about. And believe it or not, there's actually connections to Cornell in the history of Del Val. Um, so hopefully everybody recognizes Andrew Dixon White here. Um, in about 1887, Joseph Krauskopf was the, the rabbi. He was the leader of a, um, a large Jewish synagogue um, in Philadelphia called Kenethus Israel. And Krauskopf um, was really known as a social reformer. He was very forward thinking um, on the role of women, on the, um, the need for, for social programs. Um, and he addressed these issues in his writing. He was, again, very well known um, at that time. In 1894, he actually wrote to Andrew Dixon White, who was the ambassador to Russia, okay? And it was because of Andrew Dixon White putting him in touch with Count Leo Tolstoy that Rabbi Krauskopf met with Leo Tolstoy. And Tolstoy actually told him, return to America and lead the tens of thousands from your congested cities to your idle, fertile lands. Um, what Krauskopf spoke to Tolstoy about was his worries, his concerns for many of the, the Jewish immigrants coming to the United States. He was especially worried about um, the Jewish youth coming over and not having jobs um, and the, the anti-Semitism that they were beginning to see. So again, this was a, a, a seminal moment in the um, in the genesis of Del Vale. And Krauskopf actually wrote about it in my visit to Tolstoy. Interestingly, the friendship, and this is just an aside, um, the friendship between Andrew Dixon White and Joseph Krauskopf continued. Um, in 1906, White actually came to Philadelphia and he gave um, the keynote speech at the, a dedication of a stained glass window that was um, being installed in Kenethus, Israel um, in Philadelphia. This is, this is a, a photograph of that. Um, the window was dedicated to the Secretary of State, John Hayes, 
who apparently Andrew Dixon White um, knew very well. And um, in one of the publications I was reading, he gave a wonderful speech um, about this. And so this friendship between Krauskopf and Andrew Dixon White uh, continued for many years. Um, I've actually, while being on sabbatical here at Cornell, have spent some time in the archives um, down in Olin Library, which is an amazing place. Um, and these are some of the letters that I found. Um, this is from uh, these two set of correspondences. Um, this is from Joseph Krauskopf. Um, and this is actually uh, from Andrew Dixon White. It's a, it's a multiple page letter um, back to Krauskopf. And I, um, I wanted to read, uh, it's hard to, for you to see right here, um, but you could tell that there was an affection between the two men. Um, Krauskopf says in his letter, with kindest regards to your dear wife and daughter, whom I may have the pleasure of meeting at our temple, in all of which Mrs. Krauskopf heartily <coughs> joins me. I remain with sentiments of esteem, very sincerely yours, Joseph Krauskopf. So there, there was this connection between Del Vale um, and Cornell. But, so let's get back to teaching and learning. Um, when Krauskopf got back from Russia, um, what he did was he, um, what he learned from Tolstoy was that there should be science with practice. And so Krauskopf came back and he bought hundreds of acres of land in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. And you can see um, an aerial photograph of what it looks like. And of course, this is what kind of a more modern schematic of what campus looks like today. Um, from the, the hundred or so acres that Krauskopf started with, he bought more and more and more. Um, and over the years, Del Val has been gifted with farms. So we actually have a wealth of acreage. Um, we have three separate farms and over a thousand acres of farmland um, which and forest land, which we have orchards and we have vegetable crops um, and animals and pastures and everything that, that an ag school might have. Um, so the National Farm School changed through the years. In 1948, it became the Natural, National Agricultural College. Um, in 1960, it actually became Delaware Valley College of Science and Agriculture. Somewhere along the way, they dropped the science and agriculture, and we were just for many years um, Delaware Valley College. We added buildings, and as, again, as I said, we added farms. Um, and it was in 2014 that the college became a university. And so what we are today um, is about 1,700 undergraduates. We have about 300 graduate students, um, but all of our graduate programs are in business and education. Um, and we now have a couple of smaller programs in criminal justice and policy studies. We, we actually do not have graduate programs um, in any of the sciences. Um, but there are about 25 majors, and once Del Val became a university, um, we broke up into three separate colleges. So Ag and Environmental Sciences, Business and Humanities, and Life and Physical Sciences. And of course, I am, um, am part of the Ag and Environmental Science uh, College at Del Val. So we have about 90 total faculty, which is really interesting. And um, as I understand it, there's about 90 total faculty here in SIPS at Cornell. Um, so it's just been really wonderful to know that, that you know, I'm surrounded by so many people who love plants um, as, much as, as much as I do. Um, so the science with practice, that historical uh, uh, way that Krauskopf founded um, the National Farm School has stayed with us um, through all of these years and all of these changes. Um, historically, so when I began in 2000, students had the requirement of working 900 hours in their field um, before they could graduate. Um, and so over the years, that's changed slightly. And we now have what is called um, the E360 program or the Experience 360 program. And 100% of our students graduate with experience in the field that they want to go into. Um, so you cannot major in something without having worked in that field. Um, and along with the actual 
work experience. Um, we have uh, uh, classes that go along with E360 that, um, that require that the students actually reflect on their work experiences. So it's not just doing a job, it's reflecting on, wow, did I like this job? Just my, is my personality suited to this job? Is this something I think I can do long term? Um, so it's really developed into an entire program and the experiences that the, the student receive um, through this E360 program actually go on their transcripts. So it's something that they can uh, present to an employer. Part of the work experience that uh, Delvell students are required to have can be done on campus. And I think this is one of the things I've noted um, that might be a little different than here is we have, um, we have a few farm managers, but by and large, the work on the farms is done by student employees. Um, and so these are actually students who are, are working. Um, we have orchards, we have a, um, a apple sorting, uh, equipment, we have a cider press, um, and so the students are the ones who are working on the farms, um, providing mo mo much of the labor that's needed to keep um, all this acreage going. In the plant sciences at Del Vale, um, we are actually split up into two different departments, and similarly to what has happened here, you know, there's been this, this uh, change in are we one department are we two are we three um, but right now this is where we are um, I'm in the Department of Plant Sciences we have around uh, 105 students um, and we have majors in all of these areas so there's a horticulture major a sustainable ag major a turf major crop science and then um, our organic farming certificate, which I'll, I'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, landscape architecture and environmental sciences is just a little bit smaller. Um, and you can major in environmental science. You can actually do um, a, uh, a landscape architecture degree, which we have a, a DelVal alum who is here now um, getting her MLA. Um, and our program is an accredited landscape architecture program, which is really has been a benefit since the student who's here now was able to cut a semester out of her program um, because of coming through this program. Um, we have lots of different facilities on campus. Um, one of the things that's really popular, um, and this is actually part of the uh, horticulture major, is we have um, both hydroponics and aquaponics on campus. Um, and, and we uh, were able to uh, retrofit some of our greenhouses because of an extremely large, for us, donation. Um, and so this now is somewhere that students work, um, there's a class around this, and then um, the lettuce that produce, is produced shows up in our cafeteria. Um, we also have, as I mentioned, um, uh, lots of trees. The campus itself is considered to be the Henry Schmider Arboretum. And so uh, almost all of our trees and our, our shrubs are labeled so you, you know what everything is. Um, in, a, in our arboriculture class, students are actually taught, so this is, this is a class, this is an actual student, they're taught to climb trees. Um, and, and which is, is something that someone who going out into the world to be an arboriculturalist might need to know. Um, and then our, our generally in our LAES department, um, what we are involved in is the Philadelphia Flower Show, um, which is every March. It's one of the largest flower shows in the country. Um, and there's an actual class that students uh, take in the fall semester where they design the display for the flower show and then in the spring semester they actually build as much as they can on campus and then are responsible for taking it down to Philly to the convention center and assembling and painting and doing everything um, that the display needs. Um, advising is also really important at DelVal. One of the, the things that we have in place is um, it's called a hold on the student accounts. Um, a student cannot register for classes unless they've seen their advisor. Um, and what that means is that when, once the advisor um, has met with the student, 
then we go into a, a system um, online and release the hold and the student is able to register. Um, it's that important for us to have this one-on-one -on -one contact with the student every single semester. How many students do you advise? So I advise, and it, it varies, um, we added two new faculty a couple years ago. It's been as many as 30, but now it hovers around probably 12 to 15. So it gets really busy during advising season. Um, all right, so we are a unionized um, teaching institution. Um, and what that means is we are actually contractually obligated to teach 12 contact hours each semester. Um, so this is actually, this is what I'm heading back to. This is why, this is why it was so great to be on sabbatical. <laughs> um, this is what I missed. Um, so, uh, and so this is a, uh, a lecture and lab. This is a lecture, a lecture. Um, this is a lecture and a lab. I just teach the lecture portion and this is just more of a, almost like a, a discussion section. Um, I thought it'd be kind of, interesting to show everyone this is my schedule this is what so we actually um are obligated to in fact this was really funny when i came here i'm like where's everyone's schedule on their door <laughs> we have to put this on our door um this is so that everybody knows not only where we are but where we can be found because again advising is such a critical piece of, of this this hands-on this close relationship we have with students the other thing i wanted to oh, the other thing i wanted to point out was that we schedule in a way that helps us do this hands-on learning so for example commercial vegetable production um, has a lecture on monday but it also has a lecture and a lab on Wednesday. So I have a good four hours with the students um, in order to take them on trips and do longer types of projects. Um, IPM, is there is no lab, but the, the lectures are scheduled back to back. Um, so we, in this case, we have like about a three hour time frame um, that allows us to do uh, a little more. Oh, and last thing is we are also, again, contractually obligated to have six office hours per week. Um, and so these are, these are times that we have to be in our office and available to students. All right, so uh, finally to the really fun and interesting part, what I actually get to do when I teach horticulture at Del Val. Um, so this is the marketing of horticulture products class. Um, this class, once again, is really is required of horticulture majors because a lot of our students are going back to family businesses or they're going to uh, have their own farms. Um, and so in this case, we take about four to five field trips um, each semester. Um, the students are creating new businesses. Um, and in this regard, it's a horticultural business. Um, they have to actually have business cards. Um, they create brochures. They have an online newsletter. They write press releases. In some cases, the students are actually creating real businesses. Um, so it's pretty exciting when they actually have something that they're going to use later on. Um, the end of the semester is what we call Shark Tank, um, and they're actually doing presentations as if they were in Shark Tank um, so that they can get experience uh, looking for business loans. Some of our field trips are awesome. It's a little dark here, um, but this is actually the Philadelphia uh, Regional Wholesale Produce Market. Um, it is an amazing state-of-the-art place. It is the largest refrigerated terminal market in the world. Um, and if you have not been there, I would highly recommend a trip there. Um, it does not break the cold chain. Um, so it's very different than Hunts Point Market. We also um, visit uh, farms. Um, in this case, this is an entertainment farm. They have the bouncing pillows and the, the um, these are, this is like an open moon bounce. Um, and the farmers are insistent that if the, the students try that. Um, so they get a chance once again to really get a feel for what it's like to have an entertainment farm. Um, in organic food and fiber, which is a fall class, um, we take field trips, um, again, um, probably about 
four every semester. One of them is to the Rodale Institute, which as you'll see is our partner in the organic farming certificate program. It's about an hour from Del Vale. Um, we visit various organic farms. Um, this is a particular farm. This is a, an organic um, grocery store that's about 20 minutes from campus. But one of the neatest things that we do is the students are actually involved in the organic certification inspection that takes place on one of our farms. Um, for many years, I was responsible for maintaining the certification. So um, what I will do is I'll haul all my organic system plan and documentation to class. The students actually um, get to see that. And then this is our um, inspector. Um, we go through the inspection on the farm and then they actually sit through um, the, uh, the exit interview, which is part of every organic inspection. Um, this has been a really wonderful exercise because of um, having so many students who want to have organic farms. Um, so often there is this uh, curtain behind what it means to be certified organic. And this exercise really opens the curtain and shows everyone that it's not a process that is, is, is um, terrible to go through by any means. Um, the other thing that we do, um, again, because organic food and fiber has to deal with animals as well, um, we get in some guest lectures. Um, this is a cow signals workshop. And so we actually are down in at the dairy farm on campus, which you can just walk to. Um, and the uh, organic veterinarian is leading, this is actually a student. He's leading the students through an exercise um, looking at cow signals, which is a way um, to keep cattle healthy when you are an organic producer. Um, commercial vegetable production, which is, um, I've really enjoyed sitting in on Steve's class. Um, we have a lab attached to ours. And one of the biggest things we do is what's called the Farmer's Apprentice Project. Um, in one of our greenhouses on campus, we have 12 raised beds. Each raised bed is 40 square feet. And so the student and their partner raise vegetables all semester. And so it starts out, the beds start out empty um, or with just, you can see the beginnings of the plantings. Um, we do have lights in the greenhouse. So this helps in January and February when there's really not enough outdoor light. Um, but you can see that the, it becomes a jungle in here. And students really take ownership of producing their crops. Um, they they uh, love that they are able to harvest and take everything home and eat what they've actually produced. Um, not only that, but they're doing scouting, they're doing pest control. Um, and one of the most important things that they do in this project is record keeping. Um, as anyone knows today, whether you're organic or whether you're a conventional farmer, um, because of food safety concerns and traceability, every farmer needs to have good records. And so this, is a, this um, really trains them in record keeping absolutely everything they're doing um, from what varieties they've chosen to plant to what types of pests or what types of pest control measures they've done. Um, this is something that students really enjoy. And if you're ever feeling gloomy on a March day, uh, you just find people wandering in here because it just becomes this wonderful jungle of, of vegetable crops. Um, we do take field trips um, in our commercial veg class. Um, this is an alumni's farm. Um, Del Val is actually across the street from Burpee's Ford Hook Farm, um, which is a really beautiful place to go. So we've gone to Ford Hook Farm. Um, this is J.R. Peters. It's a fertilizer company about an hour from Del Val. This is Carrie Peters. Um, and this is Crystal Snyder. Um, Crystal's an alum, and so she hosts us um, at this amazing fertilizer facility. And so the students actually get to um, see fertilizer being blended and bagged, um, and some of the testing that they do at that facility as well. Um, uh, oftentimes, farms will, um, they will have exercises for the student or, or tasks for the students to do. Um, so we've, we've done everything from planting to um, uh, 
digging holes for irrigation, um, all kinds of different things. Uh, we're a little over an hour from HERS potato chip factory. Um, so we will sometimes take field trips to HERS where we meet with Jean Her, one of the owners and operators who does all the potato buying um, for the, the chipping um, that goes on at HERS. And the tour is just really fun because of course they pull the fresh potato chips off the conveyor belt for everyone to taste. Um, and then lest you're wondering why I have a chocolate world photo here, um, this is because one of the field trips that's so important to us in commercial vegetable production is um, the uh, going to the Mid-Atlantic Fruit and Vegetable Growers Convention in Hershey. Um, Pennsylvania Vegetable Growers has been gracious enough to let our students in for free. This has been going on for as long as I, um, as long as I've been there. Um, and so we go on our class day. Um, it's a Wednesday. Um, we take a bus and Del Vale used to have their own buses, but we now um, rent through a, a, a service. Um, but we go to Hershey for the day and students are able to get in. They're able to experience what a grower meeting is all about. They go to talks um, and then every now and then if we have extra time, we stop at Chocolate World. But, so. Um, we do labs on campus, similar to what Steve has done. Um, we get students, oops, we get students out on equipment. Um, we get them uh, planting, laying plastic. We're planting potatoes. Um, sometimes we are able to take advantage of what's happening on our farms. So in years past, students have actually helped build a high tunnel. Um, and so it's, I'm usually in pretty close contact with our farm managers. And if something's going on, and it fits into our schedule and their schedule, we try to jump into this. Um, this is one of our high tunnels um, that we actually plant um, and the students are able to actually set up the trickle irrigation system. So they get that kind of hands-on way to do the plumbing and, and with the headers and so on and so forth. Um, I also teach a lab on grafting. Um, and so our, uh, the students are taught uh, three different ways to graft tomatoes. Um, and so they do the grafting exercise and then we monitor the progress on whether the graft has been successful or not um, throughout the remainder of the semester. Um, IPM, I wanted to include a class that doesn't have a lab. Um, if you recall, this is scheduled so we have a long um, course period. Um, we take a couple of field trips that are really valuable. Um, you, you may remember um, Lloyd and Alex Traven from Peace Tree Farms. They are Cornell alums. They have a certified organic greenhouse, but they use all beneficial insects and IPM practices in the greenhouse. And this is one of the most um, eye-opening um, field trips for the students because they see that you can have this immaculate greenhouse full of many different species of plants and have very, very low pest pressure um, through the use of biological controls. The, um, the New Jersey Beneficial Insect Lab is an amazing place. In fact, it's probably the next to Steve is the best thing about New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, this is um, part of New Jersey's Department of Agriculture. They actually raise beneficial insects there. It is very unique. There are not labs like this um, around the country. This is only one of a handful. Um, and we take students there and they're very welcoming. Um, they show us the lab, they show us how they raise their beneficial insects and some of the projects that they are, they've been involved in. Um, students also do what's called an IPM toolbox. It's a very lengthy project broken up into pieces, but again, they're able to choose a crop um, and they come out with a set of information that they take with them um, when they're working in a greenhouse, when they're working on a farm. Um, and so the, the IPM toolbox, as big of a project as it is, I always get very positive comments um, that students have enjoyed doing this and taking this deep dive into what IPM really means for their specific crop. Um, 
I would be remiss if I didn't actually talk about assessment and student engagement. Um, I've spent a lot of time here at Cornell looking over your Center for Teaching Innovation website. Um, and I think that we are, I think we're doing what we're supposed to be doing at DelVal, which was really a nice thing to see. Um, and so um, we have a lot of time for discussion. Um, one of the things that it, it, I do is that there's actually questions about the field trip on the exams. So these field trips don't just exist because they're enjoyable to get off campus. They're tested on what they learn. Students are encouraged to take notes, to take pictures, um, and to integrate what they've learned on the farm into any project that they're doing. Um, the E360 program, again, um, students are employed, they're working, um, they're encouraged to provide feedback on whether learning has taken place. So again, I believe that we're doing what we should be doing um, as far as all of the teaching and learning um, uh, research that's been done. Um, lastly, I just have a few more slides. Um, one of our most hands-on programs, not a class, but a program, is our Organic Farming Certificate Program. We are partnered with the Rodale Institute, um, and we've actually um, been uh, uh, supported by two USDA Beginning Farmer and Rancher Development Grants. Um, really exciting. At this point in my career, I'm finally getting grants, which is <laughs> so, um, but it, which has been a whole learning experience for me. Um, we have about 75% veterans in this program, um, but they're integrated right into our regular classes, which has been a, a, a real challenge um, from a teaching and learning perspective. They're spending the summer session, though, at Rodale, where they have two other academic classes, and then the um, the, the farm practicum is essentially our version of this E360. They're actually working on a farm, and then we have a class period where everyone reflects on the work they're doing and shares what they're doing, um, and everybody kind of gets to, to learn from that. Um, this is uh, an awesome hands-on thing that I'm able to do. Um, this is global field studies, and so I do teach a course every other year in gardens, food, food and farms in Tuscany. Um, you really can't learn about Italian food without going to Italy. And, um, and so, uh, so we take, or I should say I take students and we go to this amazing farm called Spinacchia. And I would truly, if anyone here wants to take students, um, I would highly recommend this place. It's awesome. They are set up with um, places, like almost like dorms for students to, um, live in. They produce all the food that they serve. They have classes right there. Um, so this is something that, again, hands-on learning, not only about horticulture, um, but about the culture of Italy and the, the, their, the way they approach food. Um, so that's a lot of fun as well. And then lastly, our clubs and our organizations also reflect the hands-on philosophy of Del Vale. Um, I'm the advisor of Hort Society, which is our horticulture club. Um, and so we take field trips to, of course, um, see mushrooms, which Philadelphia is the mushroom capital of the US. Um, and we're not far from a cranberry farm. Um, and which I was saying to someone this morning, um, the, if, and I'm inviting you all to come out next fall, um, the farmer actually has a whole set of hip waders. And so everybody puts on hip waders and goes into the cranberry bog, um, which is awesome. And then we also take groups of students to uh, another conference, the Pennsylvania Association for Sustainable Agriculture, um, which has been historically held at Penn State, but now it's gonna be in Lancaster, so it's even closer. All right, so my time is just about up. And I just want to once again thank everyone here at Cornell for being so welcoming. I've had such a wonderful sabbatical. Um, I came across this poem from Liberty Hyde Bailey, and I felt like it was really uh, uh, important for me to finish with this. So I'm going to read this um, because it, it, it's about the way that Liberty Hyde Bailey thought we should be teaching and um, the way I believe in teaching. So. Um, there certainly will come a day as men become simple and wise when schools will put their books away till they train the hands and eyes. 
Then the school from its heart will say, in love of the wind and the skies, I teach the earth and the soil, to them that toil, the hill and fen, to common men that live just here. So thank you, everybody. I'd be happy to answer any questions. When do you Marvin. Schedule your longer field trips. Like when do you go to Italy? Like what time of the year do you make that work? Um, so the question was, when do I schedule the longer field trips? So the Italy trip, um, because it's horticultural in nature, I go in September, and I always schedule it over the Labor Day. It's ten days. Um, so we, uh, I schedule it over the Labor Day weekend, and so the students are missing like a little bit less. And also because it's so early in the semester, we actually start um, about a week later than Cornell starts. We're usually in about the second week of the semester. So students aren't really, they're missing um, classes, but it's, it's, they can catch up. They have a lot of time to catch up. You know, stop, you don't get that out of shape because you're taking your students. <laughs> no, um, we, um, we are, that's a, no, that's a great question. Do other faculty get upset because students are missing classes? I would honestly tell you that we are so, um, everyone does lots of trips and field trips. You get used to it. It's something that is part of the DelVal culture that everyone just is accepting. If somebody, um, we have a very active FFA group and they, they usually go for a whole week. Um, you, just, you just help the student catch up and provide as much support material as you can um, through Blackboard and everything else so that the student, um, you know, as I said, is missing as little as possible. Marsha. So you teach such a diversity of classes. I'm wondering, I'll bet somewhere along the line you took some risks. And I wonder about, you know, what's maybe a big risk that you took in teaching and, and what were the benefits and the challenges of doing so? Oh, thank you. Um, so Marsha asked when I took a, a risk. I think that the, um, I think that the, the biggest risk I felt was teaching IPM just because I had a very, coming out of graduate school, I had a very strong background in weed science, but not so much in entomology and plant pathology. I mean, the, the, the background that everyone typically has, but um, I feel like IPM is the class that I've, I've developed the most and at, am very, very successful at teaching. And so, yes, I think it, it I took some risks with that, but also then, I was um, very early on, I also started promoting the whole idea of, of um, beneficial insects and using biocontrols. And I think everyone now can say, wow, this is, there's so much going on in that area. Um, so that's where I would say, yes, taking, uh, taking a risk of, of teaching is that's where that was. Oh, Don. Jackie, uh, first, thank you so much for your seminar and for sharing L.H. Bailey's poem. That poem was very reflective of his engagement with the Nature Studies yes. movement, which also featured people like Anna Botsford Comstock and Louis Agassiz. Um, my question is, can you talk a bit about the demographics of your students, where they come from, what their backgrounds are like? Yes, thank you, Don. The demographics of our students, and that's a good, that's an excellent question. Um, the majority of our students are from Pennsylvania and New Jersey, um, and then the Mid-Atlantic region. Um, many of our students are still first-generation college students, um, and they uh, and they are by and large from rural backgrounds. Um, so their uh, high school preparation for college is certainly not as strong as you would find in a Cornell student. Also, our average SATs, uh, um, although in horticulture is fairly uh, high in general for, um, for Del Val as a whole, is significantly lower than the, the, typical, um, the typical Cornell student. Um, so, so while not everyone is from a farm, they're generally from a rural community in the mid-Atlantic region. And so they want to go back to that community um, and, and 
and have um, some sort of career in, um, in agriculture. Also, I should make note, um, we, uh, we do not send very many students to graduate school. Um, I would say 5% of our graduates go on to graduate school, um, maybe 10%, but, but really very, very few. So these are people who are going into um, the agricultural industry, um, working in greenhouses. Um, we do a really good job placing students at Longwood Gardens. Um, and Delvale students are known, I think, historically for being able to hit the ground running when they start their employment because they've had such a, such a hands-on type of training and so much job experience. Hannah. Uh, I guess I'm just wondering, kind of on a related note, what summers at Del Val look like? Do you try to keep students around for camp farms or a lot of them heading home? Or what? So almost all of our, um, almost all of our, uh, Hannah's question was what are summers like at Del Val for, um, for faculty? They're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I would be lying if I didn't say that. Uh, yeah, but for students, um, some students will stay and work on the farm. Um, at Del Vale. This past summer, we actually had something new. Um, since we're so close to um, Burpee's Fort Hook Farm, we actually, they um, wanted to give their ground a rest. So all of their trial gardens moved over to Del Vale. So we had a number of interns working on the trial gardens this summer. There's also just a group who works with production. Um, we have what's called a Hope for the Harvest Garden, uh, a charitable garden where we just produce um, for uh, to give away to um, fill abundance. It's, it's a local um, food charity. But most students will go back to um, where they're from um, and, and find some sort of, because they're generally from an uh, agricultural region, they'll find some sort of job that will count towards their E360 credits. Yes. Students learning to climb trees, like do they go through the tree climbing certification program in those classes? Um, so the question is, do students go through the tree climbing certification program? Um, I, I don't know exactly if they do, but we tend to have a lot of um, in that because I don't teach that class, but we tend to have a lot of add-ons in our class. So um, there's a course where that you can take that you um, get your pesticide applicators license. Um, and then in the past, and I haven't done this recently because, um, but in the past, um, some of my classes have actually counted towards the credits that you need to keep renewing your pesticide applicator's license. Um, so we do try to have add-ons like that as much as possible. Marvin. Are, you, are there things you saw here that you... So I can't wait to take back and try that. I'm just curious what you... No, and I've actually, that's a, uh, again, a great, uh, are there things I've seen here? Yes, there absolutely are. And it's been so very helpful. Um, uh, in the plant anatomy class, um, Alejandro uh, Nixon flips the classroom and I'm going to, I'm going to do that. Um, we're going to integrate that into the botany lab, which I've been working on revising um, a botany lab manual. Um, Steve in his vegetable production does um, the uh, problem solving, which has, I think is excellent because it really, um, it, it, it gives the students an opportunity to actually talk to the class about you know questions and what type of what they're seeing in the field um so yes that and then marvin i love the idea of the e-portfolio and i'd love to bring something like that back to del Vale. so we'll see all right any oh yes one more in back as a as a teacher do you have how much autonomy do you have over creating and designing your own classes versus you get this group of students that have probably specific uh requirements for what they need to learn so like what's the balance? Um, yeah, so the question is how, like how much leeway do you have for, to developing new um, and innovative class? You can, we have a lot of leeway. If there's something that you want to teach, then you are encouraged to develop a new course around that. So for example, we um, have someone who just um, was hired about uh, two years ago from University of California at Davis. As a, she's a plant breeder and she's um, developed a new crop evolution class. Um, we have someone else who uh, is interested in medicinal plants. They just developed that new class. Um, someone else, um, uh, her global field studies class is she took students to Hawaii last spring break. 
Um, so she developed not only the Hawaii trip, but a lecture class around that. So um, that's, that's because we're not doing research, we're really encouraged to do that type of scholarship um, for our promotion and tenure packages, our portfolios. It's the scholarship of teaching that is really what has to come through loud and clear. So developing new classes is part of that. Um, and then there's also um, a set of one credit honors colloquia that um, are usually available to teach if you want to try something out, just one lecture a week, um, you can do, but take that path as well. All right, thank you everyone. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.